Hey, it's Michelle Weidenbenner, your Chief Hope Builder. And today I have Catherine Becker with me. She's doing something that I have wanted to do for years, and I'm thrilled to have met her through another podcaster. And um, we're going to dive into a conversation so we can all learn more about her. But she, like me in the past, she's raising her three grandchildren due to her daughter's substance use disorder. And she quoted back in an article I read that she has been talking about starting up a nonprofit. And it sounds like recently she was able to do that. So we're going to hear a little bit more about that and how she helps families. Um, she provides relief to families um, in similar situations by spearheading support groups, just like just like me and just a different audience, I guess. Um, she has an interactive forum that's live 24 seven. There's always someone there to talk to an amazing group. And um, the name of her nonprofit, I believe is Joys and Challenges. Am I right, Catherine? Joys and Challenges of Relative Caregivers. Of relative caregivers. Okay. Well, welcome and nice to meet you. Thanks for Thank coming you. today. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So tell me, um, how long ago did you first like have this idea to start this group? It actually started uh, probably four months after we adopted our grandchildren. I was in a dark place. Um, my life had changed. My marriage had changed everything. And I needed an outlet. And so I started visiting these different support groups online and they were huge. They were like 10,000 people and no one seemed to know anyone. It was just basic. You tell them your problems and 79,000 yes. people answer. Yes. You know, these, it was ridiculous. What I wanted was to make actual friendships, actual bonds. And so I started my own and it started out a little slow. People weren't really big on coming out and having conversations with people they didn't know. Sure. So it took a little bit of time, but now we're at a point that my chat line is constantly buzzing. It's, it's amazing. I have two different groups. We have a group who are more involved in the nonprofit. And then we have a group who are just there just for the support. So we try to have our, who we call the OG, our original grandparents, we have, those are the ones who've been with me since the first, they are in both groups. And that way they can communicate, bring these people kind of out of their shell, lead them towards um, having more support and being open to, to talking. So it, it works. It works wow. really well. So do you offer like speakers and courses and tools or how, how do you, what do you give them in the support groups? How do you know? We do. Uh, we actually, we have had an adoption attorney who was actually my adoption attorney speak with them. We've had uh, drug counselors. We've had psychologists. We've had grief counselors. We've had everybody that I could think oh. of that might have something to do with, with, with what our folks are going through, sure. even a, a tax advisor. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we do oh. that. It, it, that has actually slowed down because the nonprofit has started up. And so we're busy doing fundraisers and we're kind of concentrating on that right now. Sure. But I do plan on having all that back when things kind of settle down. Well, um, before we conclude this podcast, be sure um, I circle back around and ask you how people can um, donate money to your non for profit like how they can help, because um, I'm sure they're going to want to know. So one of the things... Um, you're bringing up. Uh, so when our son and daughter-in-law went from opioids to heroin to meth, I mean, their children, they have two daughters, they were quite young and they would just go in and out and in and out of this. And I remember wanting the support group you're talking about because so none of my friends could relate. And then if anybody said anything, it was hurtful. It was like, well, quit enabling your son. Why are you taking the kids? And I was like, are you kidding me? I have to protect them. Like, you don't get it. These are my grandchildren. I can't just like throw them to the wolves. And that's how it felt at the time. Cause I was so angry at how they were leading their lives. But I was also angry at my, not my friends, but just 
society as a whole telling me like what not to do all the time, but nobody really confirming how we help the grandkids, right? And so um, I love, love, love that you're doing this. Thankfully for me, um, things turned out like those girls now are soon to be 18 and 13. So we've been through this a long time. And the <laughs> oldest, yeah, the oldest one's like, you know, just a straight A honor student. She wants to do everything right. Never going to touch alcohol or drugs and wants to go to college and make something of her life. And um, I hope she does. Right. But um, in, in the heat of all that pain, there was just nobody like somebody would say, well, go to El Al Anon meeting. And I would go and sit there and I'd be like, how is this supposed to help me? Right. <laughs> I don't get it. Right. So, um, so tell me, can you kind of share what, when you say support, like what are in the chat lines, can you kind of just describe those a little more to those who are listening and what, what that's like for moms who need help or families in general? I can. Uh, the initial thing that we do, and before that, you were talking about the judgmental thing. That is one thing we don't allow in the group is everybody, we always say everybody's journey is different. Just because it's kind of like yours, it's not like yours. And the way that they handle their journey is, is how it's easier for them. Right. Um, as we get closer we're able to give suggestions, but there's never been any judgmental uh, no. situations. And the best thing about my group is not one single parent at any time, grandparent at any time has said, I can't do this, or I'm not going to do this, not one. And that was one thing I noticed in the bigger groups. They were like, I'm so sick and tired of these kids are so ungrateful. And the parents, oh, are like, I know. And I can't, no. you can get on any time of the day and see that. And yes. my group never does that. They're kind and they're good. And oh. I've really got a good group. Yes. Um, so that the group, is... what it's like is when you first come on and join, I will come directly personally to you in a, in a message and tell you all about what we do. And we have these two chat lines. Are you here for would you like to work with a nonprofit or would you like, are you just here for support? That way I know where to put you and, and these people are in here to help you and guide you. There's somebody here to talk to 24 seven. All you have to do is get on that Facebook messenger and just say, hey, help. And there's somebody's gonna pop on and help you. We play games. We play our, our games right now. We have a game room, it's called We Got Game. And anyone who wants to join that comes in. You can be in many chat rooms as you want. Um, we play Yahtzee. We play Spades. Uh, we play Rummy Cube. Oh, we turn oh on our goodness. videos and minimize it. That way we can still talk. So we're talking and playing games. Yeah. Uh, we have a close swap room to where you just go on. You say, I'm looking for a size 5T coat. Does anybody have one? And then you work it out with them how to ship it. We're actually having a large clothing drive right now. I sent out a big box of clothes to Bayonne, New Jersey, Rome, New York, Chandler, Arizona. Oh my goodness. And there was, there was anyway, there was like four different places that, so we're trying to keep up with the clothes drive. I have a shelf out in my garage full of clothes and labeled and, you know, if they need it, but it's just a very uh, friendly, social, yeah. good people, really good people, yeah. all of them. And so do you have like parenting coaches that help? So one of the things that I had a lot of trouble with, um, not trouble, but initially the girls were like, Mimi, will you just adopt us? And I had been through foster parenting classes with my husband just years and years ago. And I remember them saying, you know, your job isn't to be the, not to adopt these children, but it's to facilitate, you know, putting them back in the family. And um, here I was in a live family situation, right? And so I said to my granddaughters, um, I know, I, I understand you want to belong. I do. I, I, I understand that. But I also have hope and I'm not your mom and I'm not your dad. And we just have to keep praying and hoping that they get well. But meanwhile, you're going to be safe with us. You're not going to have to go back until you, there's a lot of things that have to happen first and you have to feel comfortable. You always have that say, 
but I had to get them in trauma counseling. They had trauma things that they were trying to deal with. And I didn't feel equipped to know how to do that. And the parents told other people that we kidnapped their kids, their kids. Of course you know. you did. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, um, I wanted to continually, um, have them visit their parents, um, to keep that bond, but their parents were in active addiction. So I didn't feel like I, it was a private, like guardianship thing. It, it's not like I could have the, the County facilitate like visits so I hired a mediator who was always present when, you know, the, the kids would interact with their parents. Oh my goodness. Like, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know. I just had to, you know, try to find my own way through all that. So our, how do you help moms then or dads who come in and say, how do I orchestrate X or Y? And do you give them advice on that? I don't. Um, again, that's a personal thing that they have to figure out. My take on it personally, because of the situation that we have, mom moved back home with us in 2016. She, no, I'm sorry, 2017. Mia was born in 2016. She was 15 months old. Kaya was seven weeks old. Oh. But dad was a heavy drug user. He actually passed away in 2019 of a heroin, fentanyl, uh, pure grain alcohol, opioid, methamphetamine oh. overdose. It was with a can of Narcon next to him. That's what they found. So, oh, um, gosh. but Katie moved in with us in 2017 with the babies, but she was never an active parent. We always called her an unreliable babysitter. Sure. I did not know that it was, was capable, maybe. specifically drug addiction. I knew Katie's bipolar. You know, she had a lot of mental stuff going on. But at that age, there was nothing I could do except tell her, you know, you need to go do these things to be able to be a, a, a reasonable parent because she could not make a good decision. No. The men, the men she would have and, you know, the boyfriends oh. and the, she would be gone for two or three days. And it was, she never paid a bill, never bought a diaper, never paid daycare. And she would lock herself up in the bathroom for two hours, you know, and the kids screaming and beating on the door. So oh. that was the only time I enabled her. And the reasoning is because I was afraid that if we didn't, then she would take the kids and we'd, we'd never see them again. But right. I should have realized she didn't want that responsibility. Not really. Yeah, but we don't see that because we no, can't no, relate. It's just it's that not, fear. It's not in our head to even, uh, yeah, I had a friend one time say that to me. Well, you know, they're just going to let you. So I would always volunteer to babysit. Like, oh yeah, because then I knew they were safe, right? And I had a counselor one time tell me, oh, you're just enabling. And I'm like, uh, I'm keeping my grandkids safe for as long as I can. Like that was always my justification. I didn't care what, who called it what. Yeah, well, but I, yeah. You have to get to a point. My, my point was when she had Elijah, Elijah was meth addicted and, um, the state stepped in and called me and said, we know you have the other two, this baby's here. Do you want him or do you want the state to take him? Because you know, mom's not gonna get him. And I'm, of course we'll take him. So oh. we brought him home at eight, at eight days. And at that point, we, the, the social worker told us, if you let mom move back in here, we'll come and take all three of the kids. So I, I know. Yeah, so was, your choice was made for it you. Was, it was made. Yeah. And so we took everything that she owned, put it in the garage and said, come get it. And that was hard watching my child drive away with everything she had in her car. And it was heartbreaking, but I had a job to do at that point. Right. So it, it didn't get any better. She was uh, living with a known meth dealer, criminal. I mean, he, it's, it's an unbelievable um, arrest record that he had. She was just, she was stealing, getting arrested for, for stealing. And it, it was just something all the time and calling and threatening us. And we stole her kids and we're, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So she found, she got arrested in May of this year and was put in jail. She's been in jail since May 12th. Her release date is November 22nd. Oh. So I'm at this 
point now to where I'm just sick at my stomach. She has a felony charge in another county, but we think that they'll put her on probation. So I have spent my morning after I got home uh, calling uh, long-term residential rehabs for her. She had agreed to do that. Oh. So I found one. It's two, it's a full two years. They, uh, they offer college education. Fantastic. Um, you know, they get jobs. Yeah. And it's free. So oh. it's in Durham, North Carolina. So I called her caseworker at jail and they're supposed to call for an assessment. So I have my fingers crossed because she knows I have adopted these children and right. it's not the goodness of my heart, whether you see them or not. And if you don't go to rehab, we have no protected choice. these no kids. Chance. Kids are happy and yeah. stable. My girls are in cheer and dance competition. They're happy little how, divas. How old They're are they? Wait, did you, did you tell me, maybe you told me. In five the, and six. Five, five and, and six. six. Okay. And then and Elijah the, is two and a half. Two and a half. Okay. Yeah. Oh my God. But we have protected them. They don't know any of this. Okay. And I'm not going to have her come in right. and see them and then start using again. And I'm not doing all that. No, no, no. So no. that's, that's the problem. So, yeah. And, and, you know, I hope you have a similar day that I have had because my son and daughter-in-law eventually got, well, they're almost four years in recovery. They said to me, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for taking our children and loving them when we couldn't. And just over and over. I mean, it's like, it, it, it was pinch me moments because I never thought, never thought that would happen. And um, yeah, it's so I hope, you know, that someday your daughter will be able to thank you. Not that she wants them back because she, she can't, she, she, she knows. Yeah. But but that you cared enough for her children to love them when she couldn't. I mean, it's just a beautiful day when you can hear that. Um, so, but yeah, so, okay. So then I love that there's no judgment. So is there a place though, where they can talk about, well, I did this and I did that just to kind of hear what other people did with in their situations not that they're going to judge, but that they're going to maybe have another idea about, oh, I could talk to an attorney or I could do this. Any of that in the support? Yes, group? every yeah. day, okay. every day. Um, our chat lines are constantly somebody saying, well, this happened today. And has anybody had this happen? And uh, yes, absolutely. There's a lot of that conversation that goes on. Um, a lot of times we don't talk about the kids, but a lot of times we do talk about the kids. We talk about our lives. Um, our situations, but we have also all gotten to know each other very personally. I've actually met, I guess, eight of my grandparents. I took, a, I flew out to Phoenix three weeks ago. Uh, one of my grandparent couples, they were adopting their grandbaby. So I flew out to Phoenix and attended their adoption party, stayed out there three days, met two other of my members that lived in that area. We had dinner I mean, it was wonderful. Oh my goodness. See, mm -hmm. I have a same, I have like moms in, um, I've gone in Australia, California, Georgia, Connecticut. I'm down in Florida. We're from all over and we talk about how are we all going to meet? Like we need to have like this conference, this retreat, something, you know, <laughs> but it sounds like you're connecting just individually. No, um, no, we had a retreat. It oh, was actually did? in April. There were five of us that met at a little tiny house in North Carolina. We had a lady who flew in from Michigan, one from New York. Uh, Cheryl came in from South Carolina. And then I came in from, from Georgia. I drove and we stayed there from Wednesday to Saturday. And the funny thing is, although we had never met except online, we knew each other. Yes, you did. There was I never a moment of awkwardness. We had the best time. We laughed and laughed and it was just, we cried and we had to come home and leave each other. Yeah. But I had one of my parents, let's see, we visited one in Cincinnati. Then she came here with her family last weekend, along with a family from South Carolina. There were 12 of us in the house, seven kids. This weekend. <laughs> We had, but we had the best time. And so we all try to, to meet and we're actually going to have a meeting this next week to figure out when we're going to have our next retreat and where. So, um, yeah, sometime I'd love to talk to you about how you organized that retreat and what you did and, 
Um, cause I need to, I need to plan something like that. Everybody wants, and you know what else we want to do? I don't know if you've talked about this, but we want to march because the model of care I, we think is just so poor. So I'm coming at it from a mom's point of view, um, where their loved ones need care. It's kind of like, um, your daughter being in jail all that time. She's been there. Was she in any kind of a recovery program for substance use disorder or mental health disorder? Who's working? You know, they're, yes, they're criminals in that they are um, doing criminal activity in order to get their drug, right? But if we're going to help them, they, they need like, they need the care that somebody gets like for cancer, right? And they're just not. I have stories yeah. and stories of moms where their kids even OD in the ER have to get the paddles and everything. And then two hours later, they're released with nowhere to go. And it just sounds so inhumane. But anyway, um, so we want to march and I'm like, oh yeah, like I can do one more thing. I can't do all this, right? But um, so what other... What other things are you working on? So you just got your nonprofit, is non for profit, nonprofit staff? It's nonprofit. We have filed our 501c3 and we filed a streamline, which means it'll go through faster because we're not paying our officers. It, we None of us are making any money from this. So it goes through a lot faster. So I'm hoping by the first of the year we'll have it. So at this point, I cannot take donations. I can only do fundraisers. Oh, I have okay. to actually wait until that document, the tax exempt document goes through. Okay. And I'm uh, waiting on that patiently or impatiently. Yeah. <laughs> trying to get that to go through, but I'm doing it on my own. I have an attorney who is a nonprofit attorney who's working for me pro bono, but he knows that I was a paralegal for 30 years. So I can look at a document and I know what to do. Right. So the only thing I'm really using him for is review this, make sure oh. I didn't mess this up, and then don't let me pass any deadlines. Okay. So we're basically just doing this ourselves. Now, my treasurer and my um, vice president, they're actually in Phoenix. And so okay. I'm going to let somebody else handle the money. So they're, they're doing that from a distance. Okay. I like to do the PR. And the getting, you know, getting to know my members and that sure. that's what I do. I'm very social. And so yeah. that's what I really love to do. Yeah, I can tell. And you're good at it. So when you have, um, you know, a GoFundMe or some kind of a fundraising page, let me know. Um, and I'll put it in the show notes for others here who who listen to this and might want to um, be a part of what you're doing. And how do they find you? Um so let me look at my little file here. Oops, the wrong one. I had your, well, I had it up and I, now I don't see it. Oh, here it is. Okay, your email address. Can I give out your email address in the show notes too? Absolutely. Okay. And you can actually give out my phone number because that's, um, I have it on all of my stuff that goes out. I want to talk with people personally. And I haven't had any problems. Um, wow. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. So I will put those in the show notes too, but um, that's so generous. So C for Catherine Becker, B like a boy, E-C-K-E-R dot joys and challenges at gmail.com. Right. Yes. And um, isn't that the truth? Joys. Oh, children give us, bring us so much joy. And yet. There's such a challenge too. Well, I, I, what I tell people is I have two joys, my little girls, and then my little boy, he's my challenge Yeah, <laughs> because he's just an insane little two and a half year old boy. You know, they're, yeah. they're just different. He's, he's precious, but he is definitely my little challenge. <laughs> yeah. Oh boy. Look out. Yeah. And do you have a private Facebook group that moms can, could join? I do. It's joys and challenges of relative caregivers. Okay. Joys and challenges of relative caregivers. Okay. And um, I would love to, I don't know, sometime come into your group as a speaker or just as um, I, I am a TED, I just gave my first TEDx talk. 
I saw that. Good for you. Yeah. How was thanks. that? Thanks. Oh my goodness. And you know, it's kind of like what you said. It, when we feel called to do these things, it's easier because it's not about us, right? And so um I wanted families to really work at just listening to understand their loved ones and not feel like they had to fix them or that just meeting them where they are is good enough. You know, they're that because sometimes that's all we can do. Um, I'm giving another one, uh, January 28th down here in Eustis, Florida. And that one I'm coming at it from a guardian of my grandchildren and some of the things that were so so tough. So it's kind of, but I got my daughter-in-law, my son to read, you know, to be a part of both those speeches and make sure that they were okay with it. Um, and this last one, um, they're like, oh no, we don't need to, we don't need to read, read it or see it. We trust what you're doing. I said, no, no, you have to, you have to read this one. And it was really hard for them because they learned some things that I had never shared with them before. And, um, that was the day that, um, my first first grade granddaughter Addie at the time, um, her teacher called me. Um, it was the day I went and brought guardianship papers to her school, and so then she could finally call me, and she told me the story of how Addie was coming to school, and um, it was just so neglect. She was so neglected, and I just fell apart. Like it was just really hard, and it was hard for my son and daughter in law to hear that. Right. And, but yet in the course of my speech, you know, I take, take people through, you know, where they are now. So because I'm chief hope builder, remember, like I'm always trying to bring hope, but um, could my son and daughter-in-law have a reoccurrence? Yeah. I mean, cause those are pretty real, right? I mean, this is a lifelong illness, but anyway. Okay, so those of you who are listening, you just got to meet Catherine because um, what she did last night, I just have to add this. She also helps, they have a homeless shelter for people who are living on the street and have nowhere to go who have cancer, mostly cancer, but they're, they're people that are dying and they take them off the street so they have a loving place to pass. And she spent the night there. She spends three nights a week there in addition to parenting these grands. I, I'm just in awe over you, Catherine. So well, thank you. Uh, it's, I love it there. It, it's my passion. Yeah. Well, thank you for doing everything you're doing. And I'd love to have you come back another time. Um, and I guess, so going forward, um, do you limit how many people you, um, accept into your support groups? No. Okay. No, so, we don't. In fact, you would be very welcome into the group. You have raised your grandchildren. We would love to have you and you can look around see what we're doing. And then I would love to have you as a speaker. That would be great. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I, not that I know it all, but all I can do is just share my experiences. Well, it's experience. Yeah. Yeah, it makes us really, uh, it makes us experts in places we don't want to be experts. <laughs> it does. <laughs> yeah. So, well, thanks again, Catherine. And I am going to um, pause the recording here and then we can chat a little bit further. But moms, uh, anybody listening to this podcast or this YouTube, just make sure you check the show notes if you want to connect with Catherine. And I hope you will. God bless. <laughs>